<clears throat> Hi, Lori. Lori Stevens, can you hear me? Can they see us? Yeah, no. Tell them yes. Tell them yes. Yes. You can't go ahead. See me. Go. I'm good to go. Okay. <laughs> right. Lots of thumbs up. Well, folks, uh, I apologize that I'm not here in the room with you. Um, um, I'm really uh, excited to be able to continue on the last two what's going on in the UK there in, in the small conference. Um, if this is your first time at a small conference, my first time was about four years ago, five years ago, and uh, I hadn't at that point even signed on to a Twitter account or a Facebook account. So it brings back memories um, being in that classroom and having Lori Stevens walk over and show me the basics about how to log in and uh, post a tweet and uh, upload a photograph and, 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 and then just the concept that, that there would be people interested in what I had to post and that I could get a lot accomplished by 141 characters. Um, so I'm going to be spending the next hour with you. I've got a lot of information to share. I'm deeply honored to have a chance to, to be part of this. Uh, and again, I apologize I can't uh, be physically there with you. Um, despite my last name being slowly, you're going to find that I talk really, really fast. Uh, make sure that you get as much information from me as possible. Um, and equally, uh, I'm, I'm very humbled, uh, within the room and certainly within the speakers who've been at the conference, there's some amazing police leaders, people that I have uh, looked up to, followed, um, learned from, uh, in some cases directly, directly corresponded with, but I really feel uh, um, humbled to be able to share my experiences, but also honestly, a lot of what I'm sharing, my insights, my experiences are based on the practices of people in the room, the people in the UK and from other parts of the world. Can I just get a thumbs up from either of the lorries that, that the see. volume is coming through? Oh my goodness, that's not working. I'm all worried about this volume. What did he ask? Are you guys hearing? Yeah. Okay. All right, we're going to go to the presentation. All right. Okay, well, just a, a brief uh, um, backgrounder for the Toronto Police Service. We are the Canada's largest municipal police service, so city police service with 5,500 police officers, and with the fourth largest uh, municipal police service in North America. Um, we're very honored to be parting, uh, partnering with SmileCon uh, to assist with the delivery of, of this conference. And as I talked about before, my first experience with SmileCon really set me on the path, which eventually then set Toronto Police on the path of creating a social media strategy. This is my hashtag for my presentation, SmileCon e-mobilization. And the concept of e-mobilization is what I hope to drive home to you that uh, the digital platforms, the social media platforms, the cyber world that we're existing in now is a major mobilizer and driver for both the community and the cops. And if we meet in the middle on those platforms and leverage those platforms, we're going to be able to do some amazing things. We're equally going to be able to stave off some very, very challenging public safety issues. Back in the 1960s, there was a famous British invasion where the Fab Four and many more crossed the ocean and greatly influenced culture, society, and individuals in North America and around the world. Well, there's a new type of British invasion going on, led by people like Michael Brown, Kerry Blakeman, Simon Parr, Gordon Scobie, and many, many more. I said earlier on how much I've been influenced by the advancement of social media law enforcement by folks in the UK and other parts of the world, and I'm serious about it. These are some amazing leaders, just four of many more that have greatly influenced uh, the Toronto Police Service and who I look up to. And again, I'm sorry that I'm not in the room to, to share my experiences with you even further. You know a little bit about me from what's in the program and maybe a little bit more about me from what uh, Lori has introduced, but I can tell you there's a lot more to me. Just like uh -oh. a citizen, I'm a taxpayer, I'm a human being. And what I'm finding out even more in my professional life that people know me less as Peter Slowly, Deputy Chief, and more and more increasingly as at Deputy Slowly. My Twitter handle, my virtual identity, is a thing that more people know about. When I cross the oceans and go to a conference, people go, hey, you're that at Deputy Slowly guy. When I go to another police department, I'll have somebody who I've never met say, I follow you on Twitter. I'll go into a community in the city of Toronto, and they will say, hey, you and I were talking two weeks ago on that issue of public trust. And I'm starting to realize that the physical world I live in and the physical world that I provide police services in is increasingly balanced by the digital world that I live in and the digital policing that I provide. And I want that to be a theme as we go forward. A lot has changed in a short period of time. We have seen images that really confound our senses. Our senses. We've seen changes in technology. 
from huge rooms that used to just provide all the power for a simple computing exercise to the ability to, to handle all that equipment in the palm of our hand. And as we go forward, we can see that connectivity and mobility are increasingly things that are changing and enabling both the criminals and the cops and the broader community to, to, to change the way society works. Social media has really taken over. I'm, I know I'm preaching to a room of the converted, but allow me to just continue to extrapolate on the point a little bit more. The only thing constant in the world is change. The rate of change has gone almost vertical from being a, a, a nice gentle slope from back in 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, the earliest civilizations, to the middle of the last century, all of a sudden that gentle slope went vertical on us. And the rate of change, particularly in technology, not just in society, but technology, is driving so many of the changes. The rate of change in the amount of information that's available for consumption in the world has gone vertical. Sorry, I slipped in a picture of my three-month-old son. Here he is in my wife's womb carrying an older version of a BlackBerry device. I didn't have enough for the latest Samsung, and iPhone is coming out now with a, uh, Apple is coming out with a wristwatch today. Um, so in the next kid that I have, we'll have a better image. But what I'm trying to say to you, tongue in cheek, is that the new generation, the digital generation, the millennial generation, is going to be the most impactful and influential generation. And I don't know about your police agencies, but 75% of the frontline police officers in Toronto are millennials. And what's so important about them? Well, they're the biggest demographic of all time. They've dwarfed the baby boomer generation, which I'm a member of. And in the fact that they've been born into the age of the internet, and in the palm of their hands, they control all the information of world history connected to the internet, connected to each other, means that the impact that they're going to have on society is massive, unprecedented. Professor Don Tapscott of the University of Toronto here in Canada wrote a book, or co-wrote a book called Wikonomics, updated to called micro, micro, sorry, Macroeconomics. It was one of the first books I read on this topic about seven years ago, and it really opened my mind to how much things are changing and how much the police need to be aware of those changes. Those changes are experienced in everyday life, from the amount of data that's being uh, pr produced, the amount of devices that are available, the amount of different types of commerce and normal human relationships that are now taking place on, site, uh, on social media and digital platforms. There's this new concept of digital Darwinism. When technology and society evolve faster than your ability or your organization's ability to adapt, you might suffer the consequences of extinction. And in policing, that's a very, very real issue that we're facing. The curve of information communication technology is so far out that our frontline officers and our corporate infrastructure is getting further and further behind, and the criminals are starting to outdistance us. So this is an issue that we can't talk about taking baby steps, incremental steps. The normal strategic planning and implementation processes of a small beta, a large report that's written, an approval that goes up the multi-layers of a paramilitary organization, a pilot project that after two years is evaluated and after three years is fully implemented. By then, the whole context where that initial beta idea came from has changed, and the technology supporting it has changed. So you've got to be able to take a leap of faith. And no one jumps a 20-foot chasm in two 10-foot jumps. What happens is you fall between the crack. This is disruptive technology, and it's a disruptive society that we're in. The rate of change and the rate of technological change is disruptive, and it strikes at the core of policing. Another book I'd recommend to you is written by Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen, The New Age the New Digital Age, and I read this book about a year ago, and it just shook me to the core. It's a book more so than, than macroeconomics. It focuses primarily on public safety issues, from local policing, guns and gangs and drugs, to international terrorism, to actual international warfare and international um, statehood, multinational uh, issues. It deals with new concepts and new terms and some old terms, but in the new context. Personalization, civilization advance, identity, anarchy, loss of privacy, virtual reality. And now we're looking at other issues facing us. Virtual honor king killings, balkanization, internet asylum seekers, virtual so sovereignty, digital democracy. Um, it's a whole new world that we're into where cyber terrorism and cyber wars are going to be as, as or more effective than traditional terrorist activities and traditional warfare. The world that we police in has changed. In the city of Toronto, we've got the fire department, we've got special constable programs, we've got uh, paramedics and, and ambulance services, we have private security, same that you have. We have CCTV cameras, and I know in the UK, and particularly in London, it's almost a ubiquitous feature of modern society that everything is on camera all the time. 
But we've also got our citizenry, and every single one of the people in our societies are armed with at least one of these devices. And that creates a new dynamic, a new tool, a new partner in the space of public safety. And then if you look even beyond what can fit in the palm of your hand, what can fit on the tip of your finger? Sensors that can fit on the trigger of a gun. Sensors that can fit on the, on the uh, application of a, of a taser or CEW. Sensors that can fit in any aspect of a police uniform, police equipment, on any part of a police officer, on any part of our equipment. We now create even more sources of data and opportunity to leverage technology in the space of public safety. The idea of crowdsourcing and, and the wisdom of the crowd, the ability to triangulate information and put that across many different platforms, we know how powerful crowdsourcing can be. Powerful in terms of good and powerful in terms of potential evil. We've seen it on the good side with a very, very early edition of it, Ushahidi, which came out of Eastern and Central Africa. The ability of people in impoverished countries sim using simple uh, technology and, and the, the, the traditional concept of tribal communication were able to create huge, leverage huge power out of, out of technology to address massive safety issues going on in the African continent. We know that Ushahidi has been used in the Western world, in the Haitian earthquake back in 2011, and many other sites around North America where the, the resources of, of the traditional emergency services providers were overwhelmed. The public now has an expectation that police agencies and other emergency officials are able to and are willing to use social media and digital platforms to work with them in the production of public safety. We saw this again in Hurricane Sandy, which devastated the northeastern shoreline of North America, basically flooded out the, uh, the, the parts of Manhattan that hadn't been built for hurricane season. And in the middle of Hurricane Sandy, we saw how the public and emergency uh, providers had to use social media and digital platforms in order to work together in ways to overcome the safety threats that we're facing. In other parts of the world, we've seen how the role of social media has played, from the Arab Spring to the Vancouver hockey riots on the western part of Canada to the UK riots that spread right across uh, England, and where Twitter became a national debate, initially about shutting it down because it was being used by, by, by people promoting public disorder, and then eventually praised because of how it helped the police and the community organize to clean up from the riots and to arrest those that took part in the riots. We saw it here in North America, the small parkette in New York City that the Occupy movement spread virally across North America and around the world. We know for a fact that the revolution will be tweeted before it's televised. And that's a very scary thing. The criminals have been in this space long before the cops were in this space. Bloods and Crips in the United States were trading insults and trading drugs and trading weapons and plotting out killings and other crimes in MySpace well before the police were talking about Twitter and Facebook. Here's a timeline of all of the mass shootings in the United States from 1999 in Columbine right the way to Aurora, Colorado in 2012. In every single one of those mass shootings, there was information available to law enforcement personnel before, during, and after. And I can tell you, in every one of those shootings, we didn't take advantage of that information. The killers, or people who knew the killers, were putting information out about the threat before the event. During the actual shootings, there was information available to first responders. And after the fact, there was huge amounts of information available for the investigation and prosecution of those events. The, the next mass shooting that took place was in Newtown. This is where over 30 young kids under the age of 7 years old were gunned down by, by a, a mass capacity, fully automatic weapon that was turned on their kids in, in their classrooms. The police chief of the... Uh, oh, crap. Viral effect that took place where people wanted information, where misinformation was being put out for public cons consumption. And he had no public information, corporate communication strategy, or capacity, no technical ability to manage that aspect of what was facing him, his officers, and his community. And we shouldn't let any police leader be in that state of affairs going forward. We had flash mobs that turned into flash robs. We had young people across Canada, the United States, the UK, and beyond who were being bullied to the point of committing suicide. We don't have the ability to respond fully to those issues. More and more Canadians and more and more citizens from your countries are being victimized by cyber crimes, not cyber crimes specifically, but crimes that are now taking place in the cyber realm that are being enabled by cyber technology. And it's a vastly underreported crime. And so although our crime rates are technically going down, we can't say that for sure. 
because in many cases they might be going up, they're just underreported and therefore underdetected. And then we have groups and individuals and collectives out there who are using digital platforms and cyber technology to create a force for good and sometimes a force for less than good. And we need to understand that capability and we need to try to leverage that capability for the forces of good and mitigate it against the forces of evil. Here's an example of domestic terrorism that impacted the Boston Police Department just over a year ago at the Boston Marathon. A simple tweet from the beat by a Boston cop using their Twitter account produced a beautiful image of efficiency and safety and community. Mere hours later, another image showed about the devastation, loss of human life, and the chaos created by two individuals using rudimentary uh, IEDs to, to cause mass fear across the United States and around the world. People were looking for answers and looking for a source of truth. The single source of truth for the Boston bombings was the Boston Police, Police Department verified Twitter account. CNN got it wrong, mass media got it wrong, the Boston Police Department kept the community and the international community informed about what's going on, including the capture of the outstanding suspect. That's an example of the power of social media in the hands of the police department. Here's an example of the Los Angeles Police Department. One of their own went rogue. Um, Christopher Dorner was a member of the police department, a former military veteran, who had a very significant uh, breakdown and started to go on a murder spree in Los Angeles, including targeting members of his own police department. California undertook the largest manhunt in its history to try to track down Christopher, Christopher Dorner. Almost weeks into this manhunt, they realized that Christopher Dorner had put all of the information about his pre-thinking and his pre-planning for this murderous rampage on his Facebook account. His entire manifesto, geolocated information, information about his access to weapons and previous address was all there available for the investigators if they had thought to go there in the first instance. And then there's a ter terrible tragedy of the young British soldier who was attacked outside of his barracks and hacked to death by a couple of international terrorists who view and understand the power of social media. Surely this was an attack against a human being. It was a murder. It was a horrendous murder. But what it was was a pretext to create a social media viral event to advance their cause and spread their message of hate right around the world. It was a very sophisticated cr crime and it was a very sophisticated use of social media to great effect. And so we need to recognize how these things work together. The social media virtual impact on the real world human impact in order to properly intervene and prevent or investigate and respond. Here in the city of Toronto two years ago in the summer of 2012, we had two large high profile shooting events. This is at the Eaton Center in, in the heart of the downtown. In the food cart court that you see pictured in this image, two rival gang members squared off against each other in the height of the day, and they shot each, at each other. One was killed, the other one escaped without harm, but six other innocent people were shot. One of our baseball stars, uh, Brett Lowry, was in the Eaton Center shopping at the time. Before a single 911 call came into our CAD system, Brett put out a series of tweets. Rattled right now. This is serious. Oh my God, this is crazy. I hope everyone is okay. People sprinting up the stairs right where we just were. Wow, wow, wow. Pretty sure someone has just let off a round of bullets in the Eaton Center. This all before we had a single 911 call. There are two different images that Brett Lowry snapped with his camera and uploaded. We had real-time crowdsourced information with real images coming in if we were established for next-gen 911. This is the power of social media and crowdsourcing. Our officers got down to the Eaton Center. We did an amazing job of responding to the victims and calming and managing this crime scene. But if we had been set up on social media monitoring and listening, we would have had critical information well in advance of the first 911 call. We could have had an even quicker response with the potential to reduce the victimization and the fear that came from that. A mere weeks later, in the eastern part of Toronto, on a street called Danzig, a little barbecue party for a kid's birthday got way out of control. Rival gang members ended up in the backyard of a very crowded event and started firing off high capacity magazines at each other. 25 people were shot, two young people were killed. Here's a picture of one of the victims being carted away by a tactical paramedic. In her hands is a mobile device as she's putting out real-time information about the crime, information that, took, that was going on before, during, and will be critical for the in investigation that was just taking place. Here's your two victims, the two homicide victims, young people snuffed out in their prime. The young man was planning to apply to become a Toronto police officer. The young woman was seen as a hero within her community. And you can see her holding up something that was critical to her actual reality. It's her PDA, which connects her to the internet, which connects her to social media platforms. So critical in understanding who she was and how she was victimized 
and how her community was victimized and needed to recover was what she was holding in the palm of her hands there. So more and more policing in Toronto and North America are recognizing the need for being able to police with social media, digital media, and in the cyber world. More and more agencies are, are using social media to advance their core policing. More and more police leaders and police associations and police organizations are studying and documenting this phenomenon. But then we've still got great challenges ahead of us. Despite the recognition that we need to be in the game, there's what I call a digital divide going on. And it's not just a digital divide. It's a divide between the police and the communities they serve. It's a divide between the resources police need and the resources that society is willing to provide to us. It's a divide most known in the UK in terms of the austerity issues that you're facing, but not equally known to us here in, in Canada. In 2014, the Toronto Police Service budget crested $1 billion. 1% of $1 billion, that represents $10 million. The cost of living in the city of Toronto is 3%. That represents a $30 million increase on that $1 billion. And our, our contract that we pay our officers increases by 4% each year. That's an additional $40 million. $70 million year over year increase to a $1 billion budget. And that's not counting increases for new initiatives, new spending, new equipment. That's just status quo without anything else going on. That financial pressure is a huge pressure. It means that we need to be smarter. We need to be able to do more with less. We need to be able to leverage technology. We need to be able to overcome the austerity that's happening in the UK and the USA and right here in Toronto today by at the very least leveraging technology and building our human capacity. Here's an example in Ferguson in Missouri in the United States that just took place over the last few weeks. A quiet, sleepy little town where a police officer confronts a young man of color and a fatal exchange of gunfire takes place where the young man is killed. The father goes online with a simple cardboard image, my son just executed, my unarmed son. This image is captured on Twitter and social media platforms. It goes out virally across the United States, and the sleepy little town of, of Ferguson is invaded by the world's media, invaded by people of all different political stripes, invaded by an army of occupation of police officers and military officials to quell the riotous situation. And the debate about race and racism in, in the United States comes to the forefront and the divide between the police and the communities they serve is even further uh, exacerbated by the circumstances, all enabled by social media and digital media. When it comes to public trust, citizen journalists and social media are becoming a more and more critical element. We know about the elements of watching the cops and filming the cops. Well, now when you have an application that can capture the, the, the discussions between a citizen and, the, and a police officer, and, and the video between the citizens and a police officer, then you have the potential for leveling out the power imbalance between a citizen and a police officer. Here's an example called Cop Watch, which is a new application uh, in the Toronto area, where as an officer walks up to a member of the community, particularly a business minority member of the community, with one touch on their iPhone, they can activate this, they can upload information real time, video and audio, into the cloud, into YouTube and other digital platforms like Twitter, before an officer can do anything to, to take away that, that device, anything that they're saying or doing that is less than respectful, unethical, or illegal will be captured and used against that officer. The challenge we have has been documented well by academics. This is a study that was actually carried out by, by a set of UK academics back about 10 years ago. It showed that over the course of the late 90s through the last uh, decade, there were more and more police officers, and police officers are doing more and more enforcement activities, arrests, uh, Highway Traffic Act offenses, bylaw offenses, criminal interdictions. Crime was going down, but at the same time, there was an inverse relationship to the effectiveness of the police and how the community felt. There was more fear in the community and less trust in the police. This became known as the reassurance gap, and it was one of the earlier um, academic research studies that motivated the development of citizen-focused uh, policing or neighborhood policing in the UK. It certainly impacted the, uh, the work of police here in North America. It was called the reassurance gap. People were not being reassured by the efforts and the effectiveness of the police. And if you're from a business minority member, you're a new immigrant, you're a woman, you're a young person, you're a member of the LGBTQ community, there was even a, a bigger gap. It was called the optimism gap, where that sense of fear and lack of trust was even further uh, widened between the police and the community. Now we know through austerity there are less police officers. We know through cybercrime and other types of crime there are more and more new types of crime taking place. And the impact of fear is greater, 
and the impact of loss of trust is even greater. How are we going to resolve that? How are we going to re resolve that when we recognize the rate of change and the nature of change of information communication technology? There's more and more change, and there's more and more technology being adopted by criminals in the community, and there's less dollars for policing, and there's less cops doing policing, more cybercrime, less trust. That's a dynamic that if you weren't really prepared as a leader or a frontline police officer to deal with, then we're going to be overwhelmed by that wave. There's a digital gap that's taking place in addition to the reassurance and the optimism gap. And when you look inside policing, if you don't see millennials who have the capability of leveraging technology, if you don't see leaders who have the willingness to champion those changes around technology, then you have a capacity gap. All of those gaps spell big trouble for policing. So how are we doing policing right now? What's going on right now? I'm going to give you some examples from the Toronto Police Service. Before I do that, I want to just give you a couple of basic rules that I, I've been living by. And I learned these rules actually at my first SMILE conference. So the first thing that I heard from a police chief at my first SMILE conference was that cops hate two things, the way things are and change. So any new change that involves social media is going to be resisted. They don't like the way communication is going on right now. They don't like the way that the tools that they have is, are being used. They don't like the nature of context um, in the policing that they're doing right now. But when you try to bring in social media, that's change that they're going to resist. The second thing was related to me by PC, Police Constable Scott Mills, who works for me here in Toronto. He says you can't do social media behind a desk or with a computer. And what he meant by that is all the technology in the world doesn't get you a social media strategy. You and your officers need to be out on the street, out on the beat, meeting people face to face, shaking their hands, looking them in the eye, having real conversations about real problems in their real neighborhoods. Then you can take that onto digital platforms and social media platforms and continue that conversation, continue that relationship. But you can't do it exclusively behind a desk or through a computer. The third thing I want to share with you is social media and digital media is not a panacea. It's not going to solve the world's problems. It's not going to solve the Ebola crisis, world peace, or hunger. It's not going to solve your budgetary issues and austerity. It's not going to solve your trust problems or your guns and gangs and drugs problems. But it is a major tool. And it's something that we're not fully leveraging right now. And that's the part that I'm, I'm trying to push you on in this presentation. It requires leadership. Leadership at every level in the organization. Leadership from your chief of police like we have here, the Chief William Blair. Leadership from an executive like myself. But equally important, and I think more important, you need leadership from the bottom up. People like Police Constable Scott Mills, now retired Sergeant Tim Burroughs, Ritesh Kotak, who is one of the most brilliant civilians that we have in the Toronto Police Service, and frontline cops like Lori McCann. Shout out for you, Lori. Thank you for all that you've been doing for us here in Toronto. Thank you for what you're doing for Lori Stevens and the Smile Conference. Lori is that perfect example of the combination of an experienced cop leveraging technology, embracing social media, embracing the changes going on around providing public safety at the street level, and now in her role working for me, providing public safety and changes at the corporate level. We entered into a social media strategy hugely enabled by Lori Stevens and, and, and her company. We created a social media strategy about three years ago, and it put us on the map. It put us at the forefront of policing using social media. But I can tell you, as good as it was and as good as it is today, it's simply not good enough. I'm going to give you some great examples about what's working, and then later on I'm going to show you how it's not enough and we need to reboot our social media strategy. We put this in place for minimal money, $75,000, implemented in six months. It didn't require us to hire any new staff. We now actually have over 300 members trained from command officers to senior managers, civilian members, and frontline officers. We've got YouTube accounts, Facebook accounts, and Twitter accounts. We've got a 24-7 news cycle embedded and enabled by social media. We're able to respond to over 1,200 calls for service using what we call next-gen 911 technology, where we take information off of digital platforms, verify it through our traditional CAD systems, and send cars actually response in response to those calls. That's, that's basically a next-gen 911 system without the full infrastructure. We use it for recruiting and hiring, promoting and advancing the efforts of our officers and honoring our heroes. We've got a virtual online application system that we can take recruiting, recruit applicants and push them through to a point where they're hired into the organization. We've got frontline officers like Rob McDonald in 55 Division, who a year ago called a Wanted Wednesday program on his Twitter account. Over the course of the next 50 plus weeks, he was able to make an arrest a week of no offenders, any offenders within his division. In, in the course of 55 weeks, he made 50 arrests, laid 270 charges, up to and included aggravated assault, weapon offenses, 
and attempt murder. He had a 90% success rate for capturing his wanted Wednesday targets. It's a huge force multiplier. One single officer able to do all that. Our Muslim consultative committee was able to use their Twitter-provided account, their Toronto Police uh, Twitter account, to promote their relationship with the Toronto Police Service, to promote their events where police and, and, and the Muslim community get together and promote peaceful relationships. We have crime prevention programs like this one from 23 Division with Officer Ryan Wilmer, where he was able to use the Toronto Police Chief and a YouTube uh, video to promote uh, anti-bullying and a kid's help phone line that he had established out in the western part of our city. Our police commanders are holding their community meetings and putting it live stream. Here's 43 Division live streaming a community meeting that reached over 1 million people. There were only 25 to 30 people in the room, but they reached over 1 million people by live streaming their community meeting. We've solved homicides using Facebook. Detective Frank Skubik from the Toronto Police Homicide Squad had a very complicated homicide involving a foreign national uh, student who was online chatting with her boyfriend back in mainland China when a person broke into her dorm room at a university in northern Toronto, killed her while her boyfriend was still watching this unfold on the, um, on the, the online platform they were using. There was information that this uh, detective needed to use before the incident, during the incident that was captured on camera, and after the fact to manage victims and witnesses and other evidentiary information, all using his Facebook account. Here is a, a YouTube uh, video that our sex crimes unit used to uh, prevent a series of sex crimes that were taking place in the city back uh, two years ago and promote good safety information for the public to use. Officers right across our city in the hundreds use Kijiji every single day to identify and retrieve stolen property from break and enters and auto thefts. The G20 visited us about five years ago and it was not the best visit we've ever had. We did our best to provide a safe and secure environment during the G20, but we had some spectacular public safety lapses, and a huge damage to our organization's reputation. We learned from that uh, example, and we've been built into all of our public order management processes now, the use of social media to identify threats and promote the work of our frontline officers. This past summer, we had the Caribbean Carnival in Toronto. Here's, uh, here's me being pictured with a group of young people. I'm doing my best uh, effect of, of uh, Calypso dancing here, but the idea is to promote the interaction of the Toronto Police with young people in a public order event to put the best image forward. Here's World Pride that we hosted here again in the summer, uh, the summer past. We had our officers who before were not trusted by the LGBT, LGBT community walking in the parade and participating in the parade. It was a great ambassador event uh, for our officers and a great safe event for the city. We used Twitter for our guns and gangs and drug uh, operations. We have a Toronto anti-violence intervention strategy, which is at the heart of our guns and gangs intervention. Our officers are out there every single night in our toughest neighborhoods dealing with our toughest gangs, but they're also tweeting from the beat as they're out there. And as they're driving around the city using intelligence-led information on digital platforms, they're communicating on digital platforms and interacting on social media platforms. They're reaching out and touching the bad guys. They're making arrests arresting people, putting handcuffs on them, taking their guns off them, and taking those criminals off the street. But at the same time, they're building relationships with the good people and putting arms around them and working hand in hand with them and keeping our streets safe. I want to talk about the digital beat now. It's not, a, it's not a concept of the future. This is something that we're actually doing right now in the city of Toronto. I'll give you some quick examples. I talked about my virtual identity, at Deputy Slowly. But my identity doesn't happen in a vacuum. I'm connected to family connections academic connections, professional associations, uh, committees and, and, and boards and associations that I'm part of. And so I've got a network of, of contacts that go on. In every community in the city of Toronto, there are networks that happen. And although this is a picture of Jay and Finch in 31 Division, which is one of the highest density crime areas in all of Canada, there's a lot of crime and disorder, but there's a lot of great things going on. So within Jane and Finch in 31 Division, we've got a great police station filled with over 200 amazing police officers. We've got sources of industry and commerce taking place that provide local jobs. We've got sports centers that produce some of Canada's best athletes. We've got areas of commerce and, and shopping centers that provide the ability for jobs and commerce to take place. We've got a hospital that provides public health services. We've got can one of Canada's largest universities, York University, right in the heart of the community. We've got ratepayer groups um, and residence associations that work with the police to provide post-secondary uh, bursaries for local kids to go to school. We've got cultural centers like the Jamaican Canadian Association, faith-based institutions, 
and thousands of young people all working together, all networked, all interconnected. All of them interconnected on the street, in their neighborhoods, and in cyber communities as well. So if you're a police officer working in 31 Division, you've got to understand those networks and how they work together. You've got to be linked into those networks. You've got to be able to work them in the real world and then work them again in the virtual world. Crowdsourcing plays a critical component of this. I want to give a big shout out to ComproNet and Elle de Jong. I'm not sure if Elle is part of this small conference in the UK, but Elle is a senior police leader in the Netherlands Police. He designed this idea of crowdsourcing on a Twitter platform where they were able to engage thousands of people in the Netherlands to sign up on a Twitter account to receive push information from 911 real-time emergency calls to the local police. As a call would come in for a break-in or a robbery, they would push information through to these individuals who had their Twitter accounts on Compromet and engage them, their eyes and ears and their actual hands, to send back information for what they were seeing or images they were capturing. That information was then sent real-time to the responding officers. It was the first full-time example I've seen of using crowdsourcing social digital platforms to respond real-time to real emergencies, cops and community co-producing public safety. A big shout-out for that first example of community e-mobilization. You can use these digital platforms to respond to crimes and prevent crimes, to request information from your local police department or from the community, to utilize police resources or community resources, to connect with the community or your local police department, and a whole host of other activities like recruiting and, and sharing stories and corporate communications and surveying your community. You can do this on handheld devices and other mobile devices. You can connect your, your brand to your device and applications. You can provide public safety information. You can request information, two-way requests of information. You can seek the community's help, and they can seek your help. You can ask for surveys to be taking place, and you can connect in greater and greater ways. You can provide real-time information, crowdsourced information, to, in both ways, from the community to the police and from the police to the community through public safety alerts and alerting systems. You can do that at micro levels within your community, right down to a, posted, a postal code, all the way out to citywide or jurisdiction-wide communication. E-mobilization is next-gen 911, e-reporting, crowdsourcing, mass notifications, improved customer service, and so much more. If you take that concept of digital-enabled uh, communication and mobilization and put that into the real neighborhoods, the real relationships that we create on a daily basis, Here's an example of the Focus Rexdale Hub. In this hub that we've created in partnership with the United Way and the City of Toronto, at a table in a small community in the northwest corner, we've got the Toronto Police Service co-located with residents, community agencies, school boards, community funders, faith communities, the private sector, all three levels of government, um, so many more local champions, local not-for-profit agencies, all looking at a variety of public safety issues, from public health to policing issues. We're identifying the issues, assessing them, sharing information, coming up with the right intervention strategy, and we're doing that in the real world in, in a micro neighborhood. Now think about putting that on top of a digital platform. Here's a neighborhood policing strategy invented in the UK. I actually got this slide about eight years ago when I visited the UK. I've updated the slide to include social media and digital information within the slide. So this is an actual slide used by the UK Neighborhood Policing Program. If you look at the yellow boxes, you'll see where I put in elements of social, cyber, and digital media. So at the first level, when a police officer goes into their neighborhood and they're networking and asset mapping, they're looking at the rich picture, but they're also using that big data information that's available to them. When they're meeting and greeting at stage two, they're looking at the physical world that they're in, in the neighborhood, and they're looking at the virtual information that's available on social, cyber, and digital platforms. They're walking the police beat, and they're also walking and tweeting in the social media digital beat. And so at every level of those seven levels of neighborhood policing as mapped out by the neighborhood program in the UK, you can put in cyber, social, and digital media elements that will enhance the ability of those neighborhood police officers to provide and co-produce public safety in those neighborhoods. So how does that work in the city of Toronto? Well, this is how it's working right now. Here are two Toronto police officers, Michael Maddock and Marco Ricciardi. They work in 13 Division, which is right in the heart of the city, right midtown in Toronto. 13 Division Station is located at Eglinton and uh, Everton Road. So our two police officers, Michael and Marco, get into their police car. 
at the start of their shift. They drive out to the heart of their division, Oakwood and Vaughn, where you have a number of street gangs and a high density of crime and disorder. They get out of the police car and they do what every good cop does in the new social cyber digital age. They check in on Foursquare. They get out and they start walking the beat. Uniform, visible presence. Professional looking guys looking sharp in the uniform, visible and present to the community. They're walking and looking around, detecting with their, their six senses, their eyes, their ears, their nose, their mouth. They're, they're looking for information and looking for suspicious activity. They come across people in their neighborhood and they have conversations with them. They capture the information in their memo books that come from those conversations. They radio that information in so that the rest of the police officers can be aware of it. And they, they provide that, that visible pr presence as they go through the neighborhood. Now let's see what they do as they're enabled by social and cyber and digital technology. They continue walking the beat. They go down to the Oakwood Bond Lake Library. They check in with the youth um, after-school homework program that they started a couple of months ago. They work with at-risk youth in the neighborhood in helping them to achieve academic success. They tweet about it using their service-issued uh, BlackBerry. They walk on from there and go over to the Oakwoods Business Improvement Association where they sit down at a locally created hub where local not-for-profits, city agencies, the public health department, the local school board are sitting looking and sharing information around local issues that they can intervene in. Some of those issues are policing, but most of them are other agencies can take over. And again, they tweet out that they're meeting with the Oakwood BIA. On they go, and they go over for my favorite sport, soccer, as you folks in the rest of the world call it, football. And they have a little kick around, a little footy kick around with the local kids in the park. Capture a couple pictures, they tweet out about the information, and they go on. As they get to the corner of York, uh, sorry, Eglinton and Dufferin Street, they're getting involved with a robbery investigation. They get information of a person of interest. They submit a community safety note and tweet out about the information as well as putting it onto an internal uh, wiki pro program that we have called Pushpin so that other officers can be aware of it. Hashtag safer neighborhoods. They complete walking along Eglinton. They get to the local Tim Hortons where we know all cops love coffee and donuts. They say to everybody in the area of Oakwood and Eglinton, we're here for 15 minutes, drop by and say hello. Great customer service, great community engagement. They finish up their shift by walking down to their police car. They get back into the car. Another tweet that they're returning to the station. They drive back to the station. One final tweet. Thank you for following at TPS13 today. Good night. Now, in the course of walking the beat, those two hardworking officers probably met around 30, 40, maybe 50 people face-to-face -face in the real world, on the real beat. But through their digital exercises, through their social media postings, by checking in on Foursquare and putting out information on their Twitter accounts, they've created a sense of a wiki patrol. And what they've been able to do is contact thousands of people in the local area, across the city, and around the world. They're citywide, 24-7, 365 days a year. Our officers, your officers, can create a real patrol and a virtual patrol effect. So what's coming up next? Well, it's not really next because it's happening right now, but here's some themes that we're seeing coming around the corner. And I want to take you back about five years ago. I was part of a Pearls in Policing program. It's a program that was started out of the Netherlands and uh, it brought together thought leaders in policing from around the world. I was very happy to be part of this program. We were introduced to this, this fellow here. His name is Professor Sohail Inatula, and he's a futures theorist. And what his job is is to look as far around the corner for emerging trends in policing and society. And what he challenged this group in pros and police, and he challenged me, and he said, Peter, within the next half decade, your police officers, you, you're going to be policing in the Internet. And it's a distinction. It's not using the Internet. It's policing in the Internet. I laughed at him, but he, his prediction came true. The social media world, the world of the Internet, has a yin and a yang. There's huge opportunity and huge risk. The former director of the FBI, Robert Mueller, stated as he was leaving office, cybersecurity is the top priority for the future of law enforcement and security. We can see today ISIL or ISIS, whatever you want to call them, are using the social media world and the Internet to create fear, to carry out despicable crimes against human beings and against humanity. The police in the UK and around the world are using those same social media platforms and the Internet to investigate these horrendous crimes and to counter that hate narrative. Here's an example of how the UK are using voice recognition and the digital images captured off of that, that horrendous crime to investigate that, uh, that crime locally. This is an example of a local uh, criminal investigation that my officers did here in Toronto. We broke down a major uh, international theft ring 
uh, people were breaking into uh, high-end homes and stealing high-end cars. They would steal the keys from inside the home and then go and steal the cars. At $100,000 a pop, over 10 years worth, we're talking about hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars of property that was being stolen and shipped over to parts of the world from Eastern Europe to the Middle East. We finally broke down this, this uh, ring using digital technology. And we started to pat ourselves on the back and say, we finally caught up to where these criminals w were. About a day later, I saw an article from the UK where the UK are noticing a trend that instead of criminals breaking the homes and stealing the keys, criminals are simply hacking into the cars using applications. They're hacking into the systems and actually driving the car away without needing to actually find the keys. And so just when we thought we caught up to where the criminals were, we realized that we were back behind the curve again. Every time we figure out we've got a way to solve the problem, we, figure, we find out that there's an app for that. And the criminals are the ones leveraging this technology quicker and faster than us. And if you thought that wasn't bad enough, well, then there's a deep web. And the deep web is where 96% of web content actually takes place. It's where you can trade currency and trade drugs and guns and human beings. It's where traditional organized crime has moved to, and even street gangs are moving to. It's where international terrorist organizations are moving to. The surface web is Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. The deep web is where the deep black market economy and some of the deepest crimes are taking place. It's where the police and the justice system do not have a foothold. We can use emerging currencies like bitcoins on huge transshipment points like the Silk Road and the Tor network. If that's not bad enough, then we talk about gaming, Xbox. Well, what does that have to do with policing? Well, every time Xbox puts out a new game and there's hundreds and thousands of gaming platforms, kids around the world get together at different sites in their basements or at terminals or at uh, internet cafes around the world. And they share information, they co-produce the effects of these games, and they interact right around the world 24-7. Well, take these kids out of the picture and insert your terrorist group, your organized crime group, your street gang group. They can plot armed robberies and beheadings and international bombings using the same platform, virtually undetected by police and security agencies using a gaming platform. Let's go into Second Life and other digital platforms like that, where people invest so much of their money and they become the billion dollar industry. They invest so much of their time, they spend more time in Second Life than they do in their real life. They create fantasy lives for themselves that take on the aspect of reality, where they no longer tell where their real identity and their digital identity stops and starts, where they can feel that they're being victimized in their Second Life, and they'll report that crime in their real life to the police department of jurisdiction. We're actually now seeing people who feel that they've been victimized, bullied, threatened, and intimidated in Second Life coming into the police station and reporting these crimes and expecting, in fact, demanding that the police go and investigate these crimes. Is your police department ready for that? Augmented reality, connectivity, wearable technology, mobility, these are things confronting police leaders around the world. So take your iPhone, take Google Glasses, take facial recognition, put it all together, it's a great opportunity for people to be able to use augmented reality to assist in developing their quality of life. Fantastic technology, great application, great social entertainment and commerce opportunities. Great opportunity for a criminal to walk down a police line of officers in the UK, in the USA, here in Canada, and using facial recognition and wearable technology without any, any attempt to engage those officers directly can use that to identify all the officers start to mine information about those officers, start to identify officers who might have been involved in undercover operations or could be used in undercover operations down, down the road, to be able to intimidate and compromise those officers in so many ways. Now we look at how the technology is going. Before we used to take the hardware out of a computer on a desktop. Now we take the hardware out of the, the computer on your waist. Well, what if there's no more hardware? What if everything goes to the cloud, which is where everything is going? And what if that cloud and the servers that support that cloud aren't in the UK or the USA, they happen to be in Russia or China, where you can't get at them? How are you going to get to the hard drive? How are you going to get to the information? If you can't follow the money, if you can't get at the hard drive, if you can't protect your undercover operatives, how are you going to do traditional deep intelligence like policing? If everybody's got mobile technology and the criminals are the first to adapt it and able to use it, and the community is so far ahead of the cops, 
How is that going to look for us as service providers? There's an arms race going out there, and we're losing the arms race. The arms race is based on the optimistic view that technology is available for good, and the pessimistic view that people can also use that good technology for great evil. Every time someone comes up with a new way to use technology for a crime, like a 3D printer to create an actual 45 caliber um, magazine gun that can be used, we catch up by using drones. So you raise the game, we raise the game. You raise the game, we raise the game. The fact of the matter is that so far, criminals are in that game. We build a better mousetrap to catch criminals, they build a better game. Then we have to reinvent the mousetrap. And so we go on and on. What we're now doing is we're now looking at a world where the information highway, the internet highway, is not keeping up, is, is well ahead of where the legislation is. Take yourselves back 100 years ago when we had horse and buggies on our highways. We didn't have vehicles that could move at 50, 60, 100 kilometers an hour. And so we didn't need to have laws that could accommodate those vehicles. All of a sudden, we create mass vehicles. And people are all over the place using cars. And now we have to create a new Highway Traffic Act and legislation that allows for those cars to be used safely on the road. Well, we need to do the same thing for the internet highway. We've got a world on the internet that is going way faster than the current legislation is able to keep up with. We need new cyber laws. Those laws do not have to be local. They have to cross on the national boundaries. Those laws do not have to be just local within the, the North American context. But crimes that are taking place with servers that can't invite around the world, we need multilateral, multiple uh, legislation that allows us to work across these boundaries. We need to consider what the new concept of privacy and privacy legislation is. Edward Snowden completely exposed the inadequacy of privacy legislation with his attempt at democratizing information. And then if that's not bad enough, we're now being attacked. We, the police organizations, are actually being attacked. Where our police servers and our databases are being compromised. The Toronto Police Service was attacked just last year. And so you have to build up not just a cyber capacity to investigate and interdict things that are going on outside the, the organization, but you've got to be able to investigate and interdict attacks going on on the organization itself. And so we're looking at social engineering, where people are exploiting our human, our human vulnerabilities and our organizational vulnerabilities in order to attack and hack us. When we go to a crime scene, it's not just fingerprints and blood splatter that we're looking at. We're looking at digital footprints and digital fingerprints, digital evidence that we need to be able to capture and secure within secure databases that we can then use to disclose in our cases to the courts. And we need to have judges and crown prosecutors and defense counsel who can actually accept that digital evidence and use it in the court of law to determine innocence or guilt as, as required. We're almost to the stage where we have this future state. We've got the ubiquity of, of CCTV cameras. We've got the ubiquity of monitoring public and private spaces. We've got the ability to manipulate using gaming tools and find in and hone in on micro spots and large macro data, and, and all for the purpose of providing public safety. We've got to that point where we're in that Tom Cruise movie, The Minority Report where we actually get into the case where we have predictive technology, predictive policing. But I want to be careful. I want to caution you against using that term too much. Framework, we get into the same problems. Without a legal framework, we get into the problems. Without a real understanding of how the community has to play a role in this, we get into the same problems that were exposed in that movie called Minority Report. True predictive policing doesn't involve all the statistics, but it involves big data, crowdsourcing, accessing all those sensors and CCTVs and more. It's, it requires the new laws, cyber laws, privacy laws, to make sure that police officers and, and law enforcement agencies are acting lawfully within that context. It requires police leaders and police officers to be legitimate in the use of those laws and the use of that technology and to earn public trust every single day. That's what community mobilization is. That's what predictive policing can be if we build a proper foundation going forward. How do we reboot policing to get us to that point where we can actually keep up with the information that we have? This was a document produced by the Police Executive and Research Foundation of the United States. And there's a great quote again from one of the great police leaders of this day, Bill Bratton. Bill Bratton said, we mustn't let technology push us in the wrong direction, as it did in the 1970s. When we merely use technology to respond more quickly after the crime is over, it is cautioning us against simply using technology to respond reactively. 
and quickly. He wants us to respond proactively and effectively and ethically and equi equitably as we use this new digital cyber and social technology. The Toronto Police social media strategy, as great as it was three years ago, is no longer good enough. We need to reboot that strategy, and that's what we're doing. We've put together a program called Operation Reboot. It's a service-wide effort to look at all of the ways we can use social, cyber, and digital technology in all the core aspects of policing and all of the core aspects of our policing organization. We're looking at it for our overt operations, investigative operations, listening operations, and covert operations. What does that mean in terms of real policing? Well, your overt operations, that's your community policing, your neighborhood policing, cops on the beat. Your investigative operations, that's solving crimes using social, cyber, and digital media. Your listening operations, that's your intelligence gathering, your rich picture. That's using open source and covert sources of information to advance intelligence-led policing. And your covert operations, that's your deep undercover operations. How can you secure your police officers against compromise? How can you interdict against criminal organizations and international terrorist organizations in the deep web using deep covert operations? It's creating an information ecosystem where we have, we have elements at the command level, at my level, in your communications and operations centers, in your corporate communications processes, in your intelligence uh, divisions, in your, in your frontline divisions and units, in your detective services and back offices, all interconnected in an ecosystem using social, cyber, and digital platforms. It's creating levels of training for all of your officers and your civilians so that you have basic introduction level training all the way up to, to the highest levels of online investigative privileges and covert operations and making sure that you can scale that at any time. It's creating interconnected systems within your department equally, and maybe in some cases more importantly, creating systems that connect with you outside of your department. It's creating P3 and P4 public-private police partnerships where we can put together high-end operations prevention or after the fact involving critical public safety partners who aren't even within the policing environment. Here's an example of how we're addressing online fraud. Working with the Canadian Bankers Association, connecting with the Better Business Bureau and the Insurance Bureau of Canada to create a Twitter-enabled fraud chat to put public safety information, public education information, and fraud prevention information onto a, a Twitter and Facebook and YouTube platform. Here's the Toronto Association of Police and Private Security. Again, a social media-enabled uh, application where we get major uh, private sector organizations to share their critical information uh, and infrastructure information with the Toronto Police and emergency service providers to make sure that we're in a better position to prevent attacks on their infrastructure and respond to attacks on their infrastructure. We've had great work working with companies like Microsoft to advance our current contract software and hardware to better leverage that technology to advance public safety. And here's just a short list of the many public-private police partnerships that we've got going right now in the city of Toronto and across North America. I want to take you back to the golden age of policing. And those of you from the UK in the room will recognize that this is Dixon of Doc Green. Dixon of Doc Green was based on a real constable. He used to work in a neighborhood where he knew the good and the bad and the indifferent, where he was seen with respect and trust, where he had the full legitimacy of his office, where he was able to use judiciously used enforcement to address criminal enterprise and, and unsafe activities, but more regularly used prevention to community engagement and built up community quality of life and won the hearts and minds of his local community. Dixon of Doc Green became a television show, one of the most popular shows in the UK. And that image of the bobby, the beat on the, the, the cop on the beat, has really been a central image for policing, not just in the UK, but right around the world. And that's policing forward to the days of the 60s and the 70s. We put our officers off the beat and into police cars with great technology and, and uh, CAD operating systems where we were radio dispatching our officers. We could get information real time to them and they could move rapidly to where those problems were occurring. We got into this reactive mode of policing. And, and although it advanced policing, it took us off the street. The question I'm always faced is what does the policing of the future look like? We know that policing right now looks like this, where we have cops on the beat and in cars where they're using technology in the palm of their hands, Blackberries and iPhones and Samsungs, connected to the Internet, connected to social media platforms, where the most powerful tool that a police officer has on his or her belt right now is a personal uh, device. And so we're now in the current. Well, what does the future look like? Well, the future is now. Here's the NYPD modeling Google Glasses. 
Here's a chief of Salt Lake City using a body-worn camera, in this case, on his glasses. We're seeing the adaption, the adaptation of technology, connectivity, mobility, augmented reality, all to advance public safety and policing. I don't want you to forget the human factor, though. As important as technology is, you can give all the technology in the world to a cop. But if he or she is not capable of using that technology, understanding the legislation and the, and the legal requirements of that technology, able and willing to use it in all their aspects of their police service delivery, if you can't get into your police service through recruiting and hiring millennials who are just natural adapters of technology, if you can't build that into your core human resource and human capital systems, if you don't have an HR strategy for your IT systems, for recruiting and hiring and staffing and deploying and rewarding and promoting, you will not be able to fully leverage IT within the policing environment. Peel's principles, Peel's nine, nine pr principles. Again, another great advancement for modern policing from the UK. Something that is at the heart of policing here in Toronto and across Canada. There was recently a blog that I came across written by Sergeant Tim Burroughs, who's now retired. Tim uh, identified a statement from Robert Peel, and it said, one day the world will be all at Twitter with the principles of modern policing. Sir Robert Peel's nine principles were then updated by Sergeant Tim Burroughs to include the new social media in, uh, information. And I encourage you to go to Tim's blog and have a look at how he's updated that. But at the core of Peel's principles, the concept of winning hearts and minds, the need for police officers in their neighborhoods, in their daily activities, to win over the hearts and minds of the citizens and the communities in which they serve. And when you win hearts and minds, you can actually capture the use of their eyes and ears. The community will look for suspicious activity. They will listen for intelligence information. And most importantly, they'll share that information and they'll work with the cop on the beat in order to co-produce public safety. They'll physically pick up the phone and call the officer. They will physically reach out and handshake that officer and work with that officer. They will physically be present to provide their testimony in the court of law. That's the whole idea of Peel's principles, winning hearts and minds, eyes and ears, and getting people's hands involved. In the city of Toronto, we are blessed with over 5,500 amazing police officers, Lori McCann being one of them, Tim Burroughs, and Scott Mills. We have so many good cops and so many good neighborhood, neighborhoods doing so much good work. But when you put into the hands of those good cops the power of the internet, social, cyber, and digital platforms, when you enable them and empower them by education, good procedure, good training, good leadership, good supervision, good evaluation, good rewards, when you empower those officers with the social, cyber, and digital media, then they can become force multipliers for you. When you give them Twitter accounts like we have in the hundreds, when you put them into those neighborhoods like a neighborhood police officer does in the UK, then you can create real-time community e-mobilization, social, cyber, and digital platforms, leveraging technology, leveraging the power of the human being, that officer in the uniform can take us so far. So hashtag thank you for allowing me to be part of what you're doing here today. I'm so sorry we don't have time for more questions and answers, but if you'd like to follow up with anything that I've said, please reach out to me on Twitter at my Twitter handle at Deputy Slowly. I want to thank Lori McCann for being there to represent me and represent the Toronto Police Service. I want to thank Lori Stevens for being a leader in police, not just here in Toronto and in North America but around the world. I want to thank her for taking SmileCon right around the world. And I want to thank you for what you're doing, you in the room there, for what you're doing to advance police and law enforcement using social media in your neighborhoods. Thank you very much and God bless. I hope you have a successful conference from here on in. No, no, hi. Hi. Thank you. Just wait. I know you can't do that.